Oh, and then just make it full screen. So I'll go ahead and put these lights on full again because you have your guest here standing. Okay. Yay! So if you can do me a really big favor when you're finished, if you can say exit and then shut down, that'll be great. Shut because down it's, will come up when we have first exit. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So and that it. way um, it saves the life of the um, bulb. Those bulbs oh, are yeah. extremely oh, ridiculous. So yeah, so that's it. Um, like I said, you can do your lighting right on here. Just press it to AV and the lights go down. Um, it doesn't look like you're going to need to close any drapes or anything because of the lovely weather. Um, so there's, you can, there are different, um, different lighting. You can check. Yeah. Yep. So you can do it whichever there are four different. Okay. All right. You're welcome. Thank you think you're all set? I'll be downstairs. Okay. I'm interested in yours too. Um, well, I've heard a lot about the Hawaii situation. Go there, right? Every year they have that wonderful one. Good to see you. Well, nice to see you all and uh, folks from different parts of campus and AIP, uh, participants in the Summer Institute. Uh, welcome all. Uh, our speaker today, Dr. Amy Perkins, um, is a you know, rare blend is a cliche. This is a rare blend person. Um, we grew up with your parents teaching at the East West Center, but long before you got there, or maybe not so long, I think you were two when you went to Hawaii. Um, his dad was from Massachusetts and his mother was Hawaiian, so you can hardly imagine a larger split geographically and culturally speaking. And uh, those two edges of the American landscape. Um, Umi went to school uh, both on the continent and in Hawaii, uh, did a PhD in political science, interested in land tenure, tenants, um, property, and eventually that got him interested in questions of indigenous rights and claims and identity. Um, 
and as you'll see shortly, his grasp of uh, this question that's the title of the talk today is deeply informed. This is not a superficial dash off article for the newspaper. He's thought a lot about it and um, his blog attests to that. It's, it's really very rich information and very timely information. These issues are being um, more than discussed, more than debated in Hawaii. They are really essential existential issues that are going on and they echo back and forth between Indian country on the mainland and indigenous Hawaiian uh, views and sensibilities uh, in the islands. I mean, I want to thank you very much for making the trip to join us uh, and sharing what you've learned and what your uh, wonderful anxieties are. But before I ask you to give your talk, the American Indian Program would like to uh, share something with you. Jolene? Yes. Tara Eskenaha, Seiko, Dr. Perkins. My name is Jolene Rickard, and I'm the director of the American Indian Program and also faculty here at the university. And I'd like to introduce you to both an alumni, alumnus, and a uh, current student, and they'd like to welcome you here to these Tara Eskenaha, my name is Mia. Um, I'm Tuscarora, but um, I'm an alumni from Cornell, and I want to welcome you to the ancestral homelands of the Cayuga Nation. And we'd just like to share with you a little bit of something from this part of the world, and this is our heritage, white corn. And at Tuscarora, if you look us up, we're known for actually uh, keeping this seed going, and we actually have an expert on this in multiple ways, Dr. Mount Pleasant, if you have any questions about planting. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, aloha kako, as we say in Hawaii, um, that means, uh, aloha is an English word now, I guess, but it means all of us uh, encompassing, and includes me. So, um, People always say they're happy to be there when they're in Hawaii, but I'm really happy to be here at Cornell after being waitlisted in 1989. <laughs> so um, I also want to thank the organizers of the conference for bringing me in on a fairly short notice. Um, uh, the three uh, professors who organized it, uh, Chuck and Ray and Paul, and then Lori, who did my travel, travel accommodations. Um, I also want to recognize the, the Cayuga, whose land we stand on. That's, um, you know, the University of Hawaii is on Hawaiian uh, ceded lands, which I'm going to talk about, so it's a similar situation. The, uh, the title of my talk is Occupied Minds, and I'll talk about why I chose the title. It's why you seeded or seized, and I'll, I'll get into both of those, those words in the subtitle. But, but what it's really about was the title of my uh, article in The Nation uh, in January. Um, I had some really boring title for this article, like Hawaiians Try to Reconcile Past and Future I'm almost falling asleep right now from that, but uh, uh, the editor of The Nation, um, Christina Vanden Heuvel, she likes to just cut to the, to the chase, and she, she gave it a name that's really what it's about. It's Hawaii, an occupied state. Now, I've been part of a, an academic community at the University of Hawaii that's been looking at the question of occupation from a very specific point of view. Um, not really as a metaphor, but really in terms of international law, and that's where I'm going to be focusing, although just this morning's session has, uh, people might have seen me adding to my presentation just, just from what we brought up in the morning. But to look at it from international law, the, the evidence that Hawaii was in fact sovereign, and that's, a, and that's a prerequisite. If we're talking about occupation from an international law perspective, it has to be 
an occupation of a, of a sovereign nation to begin with. Um, and that's, as we see it, the, the distinction between occupation and, and colonization. So evidence of this sovereign status uh, consists of man, the many international treaties that Hawaii had from 1843 um, through the overthrow, really. Um, starting in 1843, November 28th, the first one was the Anglo-Franco Proclamation, which uh, recognized, you can see it up here, that recognized the Sandwich Islands as an independent state and promised never to take possession of them. Uh, this date, November 28th, became a Hawaiian national holiday, uh, Independence Day, uh, or in Hawaiian, La Kuoko. And then... Many other countries followed suit through treaties with Denmark, 1846. Uh, five treaties with the United States eventually. This is the second one in 1849. First one was 1845. Um, a fourth treaty by 1851 with the United Kingdom under Queen Victoria. Uh, multiple treaties with France. This is Napoleon III. Sweden and Norway. Belgium. Under King Leopold. At the bottom here you can see... Majesty Leroy der Eels Hawaiian Antilles. I'm just pointing that out to show these are really treaties with Hawaii, not just fancy looking documents. Um, <laughs> in fact, I brought a book um, with all the English translations of all these treaties. I was going to bring the book, but then I remembered all the times I've been stopped at the airport and um, wondered how that, uh, that book would look in my, in my carry-on bag um, in this era that we're in, post 9-11. Um, the treaties with the Netherlands, Italy, Spain, and again, then you see at the bottom here, uh, Las Islas Hawaianas, Switzerland. Um, interesting point here about three weeks ago, Switzerland has said officially that this treaty is still in effect. So let that sink in. Uh, treaties with Russia under Tsar Alexander II, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then Hawaii actually had treaties with the, uh, the states that, that became Germany before Germany was unified. Um, so Hawaii is actually, as, as a nation state in the Westphalian system, is older than Germany and Italy. It's a treaty with Japan. I have an English translation of this if anyone wants to see it. I don't have to take my word for it. Uh, treaty with Portugal and Samoa in 1887. This was part of a, trying to make a confederation, a Pacific confederation. So Hawaii is uh, a small nation state. We're talking about a, a little under 50,000 uh, nationals. Uh, a little over 40,000 of them are native Hawaiian. But nearly 8,000 of those are not native Hawaiian. So we, we really are talking about citizenry here and not nativeness. Uh, and on the other hand, there are about 2,000 American nationals living. Uh, that's, that's the majority of the, the people who supported the overthrow there, some other foreigners. Um, this is from an atlas from 1889, uh, the flags of recognized nations, and you see at the top right, the Sandwich Islands. We talk about that flag later. Um, so, the point of that is that Hawaii had these treaties and that there really weren't that many uh, recognized uh, nation states within the family of nations at the time, the time Hawaii was admitted. And even for another hundred years, there were really less than 50. Um, and we can uh, problematize that, if you like. Uh, the Institute is about land, and this is actually my area of, uh, of research. The what we call the so-called Great Mahele, was instituted between 1848 and 1855. It was uh, the beginning of private property in Hawaii, and all land titles in Hawaii can trace back to this. Um, in 1850 was the Kuleana Act, where Hawaiian uh, commoners, or what they call the Maka'inana, were able to claim land, not buy land, but claim it, um, for free, and the reason they could get it for free is that there was this multi-layer uh, concept of land. And the ground here is one layer of ownership, a 
uh, one-third undivided interest in all land in the kingdom was for the, the commoners as a class, the Makayana as a class. So the importance of this is that the, the traditional understandings of land were actually embedded into the modern uh, land tenure system that was created. And this system, it continues until today. So they, they understood what a, a modern land system looked like. And some of my research has been looking at the native agency and the create in the creation of that uh, system. That it was not completely imposed; it was co-created by uh, Hawaiian elites and foreigners, uh, foreign advisors. So Hawaii had a private land system. In 1887, there was the kind of overthrow before the overthrow. Um, King David Kalakaua, who was the seventh out of eight monarchs. Uh, was uh, stripped of his power in what came to be called the Bayonet Constitution. We were talking about signing treaties at gunpoint earlier. Um, he was trying to signal that by calling the, the Constitution the Bayonet Constitution. Um, there wasn't a gun literally pointing at his head, but it might as well have been. There were uh, a militia of pro-sugar uh, supporters uh, marching around the palace at the time the Constitution was signed. Um, and it all was a response to trying to renew a reciprocity treaty that would allow for duty-free sugar to be sold from Hawaii to the United States. Sugar was, uh, it was, they called it king sugar. Uh, sugar was uh, the, the primary industry, and it increased tenfold with this treaty, and eventually twentyfold. So the problem was, the United States would only uh, renew the treaty if the Hawaii would uh, cede Pearl Harbor for exclusive use of the United States, and the king wouldn't do that. So they, they kind of undercut him. He was still king, though, and then his sister inherited the throne. Uh, and then two years later, in 1893, January, she was overthrown. Um, but looking at it from an international law point of view, we call it an intervention. Um, and intervention is really the entire purpose of international law, is to prevent uh, one country intervening in another. And if you look at her language here, that she cedes her authority under protest to the U.S. military only. She doesn't cede to the rebels who were um, sugar growers who formed a provisional government. She doesn't cede to the United States government. She cedes just to the military. So she's really signaling again that this is a this is done under duress. And she does it temporarily. She thinks that, um, that when the facts are presented, they, she'll be reinstated. And some new research on that has shown that actually there was an agreement of, re of reinstatement that she was supposed to be reinstated. It was signed by the Queen and President Grover Cleveland. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Even at the time of the overthrow, Grover Cleveland was calling it an intervention, calling it an occupation. Saying the military occupation of Honolulu was without justification. Um, it was neither a benevolent occupation nor necessitated by threats to life or property. Um, the uh, American sugar grower community was saying that, uh, that uh, to replace the Constitution constituted a threat to their, to their lives, that she would be of become a benevolent, no, sorry, an arbitrary dictator. So Cleveland got messages from the Hawaiian Kingdom uh, representatives and, and didn't take sides immediately, but said, let's investigate. Uh, he did this in the blunt report. This is fair, fairly well known in the Lions, especially uh, by an act of war, a friendly and confiding people has been overthrown. This is the wrong we should endeavor to repair. But it goes on to say that the provisional government that was established didn't try to assume any kind of valid form, a constitutional form, or uh, even practice any kind of popular government at all. In fact, they were saying openly that the people of Hawaii are unfit for any democratic kind of government. And they're, best be, they're best be ruled by arbitrary or despotic power. So the Blunt Report came down, it's one of the most scathingly critical documents against 
U.S. foreign policy. But then there was the Morgan Report, which accepted the Blunt Report facts, but said the U.S. has a split, special right to intervene. Um, Morgan is a senator. He's the leading senator in favor of annexation. This is John Tyler Morgan, uh, Civil War general. And this is not very well known, but uh, in his private life, second grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan for the state of Alabama. So that's something that's uh, not really out there because in this debate about whether the overthrow was legitimate or not. Uh, but Morgan was instrumental in a secret debate on annexation that occurred in 1898. Uh, they went behind closed doors and there's about 80 pages of text uh, in the transcript of this. And it wasn't released until 1969, so 71 years after the overthrow, after the annexation. And so we can now see what was in that. It's, it's a lot of text. I'm just giving some quotes to be representative. Um, there was Senator Augustus Bacon was saying, you know, on, by what authority can Congress annex Hawaii? And Senator Morgan said, what we're really doing is empowering the president. We are the legislature empowering the president to do it, to enable him to do it. So right there, that goes against the 100 years of narrative that we've been told that uh, Congress annexed Hawaii by a joint resolution. Now we're seeing Morgan saying that it's the president who's going to annex. So if the president could annex, probably McKinley would have done it as soon as he got into office. It seems that uh, what really might be going on here is occupation. Bacon then sort of chided his, uh, his colleagues in the Senate saying, if we can't do this constitutionally, nobody should be supporting an unconstitutional method of annexation. None of these are all Americans saying these things. Um, and then on a more practical note, Senator Richard Pettigrew was saying, it's not even practical. We don't even need Hawaii in practical terms. This is now Spanish-American War. They wanted to use Hawaii as a coaling station. He's saying it's, it's 800 miles out of the way we could coal in other places that we already have jurisdiction over. Um, he says, why bring Hawaii into this complication? And some of them were questioning that, that, that Hawaii was a, a neutral country, and you're violating that neutrality. That's on the Senate side. On the House side, Thomas Ball of Texas put it pretty succinctly um, that the joint resolution that ended up uh, passing is a deliberate attempt to do unlawfully that which cannot be done lawfully. Okay, so you have all these arguments back then. What about uh, now? If you fast forward to just a few weeks ago, um, in February this year, one of my former students, uh, had a meeting with Justice Antonin Scalia and asked about the legitimacy of Hawaii's annexation. And Scalia said, if the House and Senate agree on a resolution, then it went through a process. That was his explanation. Uh, and when my student, uh, Jacob Aki, brought up uh, you know, international law, he says, well, there have been hundreds of years worth of problems there. I think the takeaway is that the uh, Supreme Court Justice couldn't completely hold his own against a college sophomore. <laughs> um, that's interpretation. So rewinding back to uh, the 18, uh, late 1800s, there was kind of a drumbeat for annexation. General Schofield here, everybody in Hawaii knows the name Schofield. It's the largest military base in Hawaii, Schofield Barracks. Um, he came to Hawaii uh, disguised as a civilian and kind of reconnoitered the islands and made a very strong case that Pearl Harbor was the best harbor in the Pacific and that if we do not occupy and fortify Pearl Harbor, then our enemy will do it and use it against us. On a more academic level, uh, that uh, historian of naval, naval history, Alfred Mahan, said if we preoccupied them, the Hawaiian Islands, fortifications to preserve them to us. So these kind of, uh, they were giving testimony in Congress about the importance of Hawaii. 
Um, another one was uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who said, if it were up to me, we would annex those islands tomorrow. So there's a drum beat for annexation and a drum beat against annexation. In Hawaii, there were petitions. This is somewhat known. My dissertation chair, Noi Noi Silva, wrote a book about this. Uh, petitions that were circulated, they gathered 21,000 signatures on one petition against annexation and 17,000 on another petition calling to, for the reinstatement of the Queen. Um, if you were to add those up, it's 38,000 signatures out of a Hawaiian population of 40,000. Now, we don't actually know how much um, overlap there was, but if there was no overlap, then you're talking about 95% um, opposition to annexation. So try to imagine a petition in the United States getting 285 million signatures, and that's what we're talking about here. It's inconceivable. It's in, you could, Americans will never agree on anything to that extent. But uh, that's what we had um, ostensibly with the petitions. And um, Hawaiians can find their ancestors on these petitions. My great-great-grandfather signed it, my great-granduncles, my great-grandmother are in there. So there were two treaty attempts, one at the end of the Harrison administration, just as he was going out as a lame duck, he rushed a, a treaty. That was withdrawn by Grover Cleveland. And the second annexation attempt was that after Cleveland's term was up, June 1897. And it seems that the petitions had some effect, Not they weren't the total uh, sole reason for the failure of the treaty, but a partial reason. Another reason was... Uh, sheer racism that um, Americans actually didn't want uh, Hawaiians to be U.S. nationals. Um, the Queen went to D.C. to file a protest. By this time, they're calling her Mrs. Dominus to sort of demote her from Queen to the Okalani to just the husband of that guy, John Dominus. When they, when they call her Mrs. Dominus, she's kind of like, you know, who's that? Uh, she'd never gone by that name. So, no treaty is able to be reached, and so they, uh, well, the Spanish-American War breaks out around March 1898, and it's rally around the flag effect, and you just have to take Hawaii by any means necessary. So they follow the precedent of Texas and claim to annex Hawaii by joint resolution. So the resolution says that the House and Senate jointly accept the, set, the said session, so they're accepting an offer of annexation from the government that overthrew the Queen. So there's two problems here. One, uh, does, does a joint resolution annex territory? And the second one is, even if it did, can you make an agreement with what is essentially a puppet government of the United States? I'm talking about contracts here today a little bit. Um, Are there two parties to this to this uh, joint resolution? Is there, a, is there a buyer and a seller, to put it in simple real estate terms? Or is there only a buyer who has extended and, and created a puppet government and made an agreement with itself? Um, I can talk about uh, the resolution more, but um, to look at what the international legal theorists have to say, Lassa Oppenheim says that the only form in which a session can be effected is an agreement embodied in a treaty between the seating and acquiring state. So two parties and a treaty. Admittedly, that could be out of date. Um, so to bring it up more currently, there was an acting assistant attorney general, Douglas Kimiak, who said, uh, who sort of stumbled on annexation, and that was just... Uh, in, in trying to do some work on the territorial waters of the United States. And he came across a joint resolution. So he asked the question in a memo, uh, whether this action demonstrates the constitutional power of Congress to acquire territory is certainly questionable. Therefore, unclear which constitutional power Congress exercised when it acquired Hawaii, a joint resolution. Um, these are the kind of admissions I always look for, the admissions from people who it's not in their interest to do so. You know, who cares what I say? I'm biased. It's uh, the least likely people to make your argument are the best 
people to make it often. Just a note on the question of, of the word seed. Uh, what part of what was transferred was the public property of the Hawaiian Islands, what we know called the seeded lands. That's the that's the standard term. Looking in the dictionary the at the definition of the word seed, to yield or grant typically by treaty. So that has caused a lot of people to question, uh, are there any ceded lands at all? Were there any lands that were actually ceded? And so people, Hawaiians are starting to call them the ceased lands to get back to the issue in the title. There's a really bad picture of the ceded lands. Um, interestingly, it's hard to find a good map of the ceded lands because the government has not kept track of which lands those are. Um, I can talk more about that. To bring it somewhat more up to date, uh, we talk about a definition of occupation. This is, I'm not giving this as a definitive one, but Ben Vinicki, who we talked about earlier this morning, defines occupation as effective control over territory to which that power has no sovereign title and without the coalition of the sovereign of that territory. Um, so one argument that's come up in, in our movement is uh, called the presumption of continuity. In other words, on who is the burden? The, who does the burden lie? Who bears the burden to prove whether Hawaii is or is not part of the United States? Um, international law seems to point to the fact that it's not on, the burden is not on Hawaiians, it's on the United States to prove that it has sovereignty over uh, Christina Marek says that uh, agreements between puppet governments, this is getting back to the previous point, agreements between puppet governments and their, uh, and their own uh, home government are not genuine, genuine agreements, even if they're correct in form. They are decrees of the occupant disguised as agreements if the occupant, in fact, concludes with himself. The italics are my emphasis. And as far as the presumption of continuity, uh, according to Marek, the continuity of the occupied state is safeguarded and that this is a clear objective to rule of international law. And that's even if all traces of effectiveness of the, of the occupied state are eliminated. To go back to Ben Benisti, I thought it was significant that um, in on page one in paragraph one of Ben Benisti's book, he says the occupying powers thus precluded from annexing the occupied territory or otherwise changing its political status. So I think he thought that that was an important enough point. These fake annexations uh, to put right in the beginning of the introduction, and this is. This is up to date. This is uh, even given the evolution of the law of occupation, which has been around for several centuries. Now, these theories are put to the test in the permanent court of arbitration at the Hague. Uh, in the middle is the Peace Palace. On the right side of the building is the International Criminal Court, with, which people are familiar with. On the left side is the permanent court of arbitration. Uh, on the top left is Keanu Sai, who's been responsible for a lot of this analysis. He was the lead agent in this case, representing what he calls the acting Hawaiian kingdom. So I'm going to get to that, that question later of uh, who gets to speak on behalf of, this, of an occupied state. On the bottom right is James Crawford, who is uh, the lead judge of the permanent court and professor of international law at Jesus College, Cambridge University. The bottom left picture is on the days that Hawaii was in the world court, the Hawaiian flag flew with the flags of other countries. This is the Hawaiian flag right here. Britain and France, so on. So, with all this evidence, how did we come to think Hawaii was annexed in the first place? Well, it seems that there was some effort. It wasn't actually that... Uh, it, it wasn't... It's not as much as we might think. Um, but there was evidence on the American side. In 1901, they wrote a history of the Department of State in which they just basically say straight up, 
what is annexed by Tunisia today. Now, it was only three years after the annexation, so the idea that they forgot what had happened is very unlikely. Um, on the Hawaiian side, it was more symbolic. Uh, there, was a, there was a school called Honolulu High School, and the perpetrators of the overthrow went down there as now as a governor uh, and changed the name to McKinley. McKinley was the one who signed the joint resolution. And then they put up this statue, and in its hand, he has a rolled up piece of paper that says on it, Treaty of Annexation. They even had a debate about whether to put the words Treaty of Annexation on the inside of the paper or on the outside. It was uh, something that was very important. Um, the first book to come out about Hawaiian history after annexation was by Bell Brain, who said, Hawaii is annexed by vote of its people. Now, anybody at the time knew, even those for annexation, that there was no vote. Congress made sure that there would not be a vote. Everybody knew that the vote would come out at the minimum 94% against, 6% in favor of annexation, uh, more likely 98% against, and 2% in favor. So everybody knew you can't have a vote. And then more broadly, there were pretty massive programs for Americanization, or uh, international legal term would be indoctrination, um, speak American, speak English, the language of America. Um, Hawaiian language is banned in schools, and then it's banned in, in government. And then I think uh, the recognition of the Republic of Hawaii was another um, pretty strong piece of evidence that got people to think Hawaii actually had been annexed. Although Grover Cleveland said, looking back, he's ashamed of the whole affair. I called my talk Occupied Minds because uh, it's my belief that if this dilemma is to be resolved, it'll be resolved, uh, resolved in, the, in the realm of discourse. Um, and speaking of discourse, it's interesting to note that the Department of State Office of the Historian, you know, they used to have an article on annexation, and now it says on their website, this article has been removed pending review to ensure that it meets our standards for accuracy and clarity. Uh, the revised article will be posted as soon as it is ready. And it's been like this for uh, a little over a year. So we're kind of waiting for bated breath to see what the new narrative is going to be. Okay, I've uh, come down pretty hard on one side. I'd like to admit some of the limitations of the problems with this line of reasoning. Actually, this list here was about half as long this morning as it is now just to, uh, due to what we've been talking about in our institute. Um, the recognition of the Republic is, uh, that's a problem for this argument, I would say. Um, it's unclear whether that would hold up in an international court as being legitimate. I mentioned the question of who can speak on behalf of an occupied state, but I, I can tell you that there have been some efforts to have Switzerland become what's called a protector power. Um, that Switzerland, having international standing, could speak on behalf of uh, Hawaii, because Hawaii has no legal uh, voice. Um, there are some issues with the law of occupation as it as it has evolved. Uh, the the course that the court the case that went to the world court was actually about <laughs> was about a guy who drove around on Hawaii Island with no license plate, and then claimed that uh, the kingdom of Hawaii law doesn't say anything about having to have a license plate. <laughs> So one thing Ben Benisi is pretty clear about is that law of occupation adapts to changing times. And so you could make the argument that that case is actually frivolous, that had people actually thought about it as an occupation, it would have adapted to the emergence of cars. And like, um, the doctrine of devolatio, which was mentioned earlier today, um, or of conquest, that, that is an issue when people say, okay, there was no conquest, but there could have been, there, there will be, um, I can talk more about that uh, in the question period. One thing that I was thinking about today as we were talking is the state of exception. Uh, a lot of people were bringing up the idea that often occupiers see themselves as the sole exception. Um, Agamben wasn't mentioned, but, I, but I, it came to mind for me. How legitimate is that state of exception? And then there's the question of, uh, if this is a belligerent occupation, is Hawaii at war? Or was it at war? Um, the narrative goes that Hawaii was a neutral country pulled into a war 
between the United States and Spain. Um, but Yanusai, who I mentioned earlier, has been has been thinking about this, and so he wrote an article on his on his blog, which I actually recommend. It's very very academic. Um, the article is called uh, "Hawaii's Been in a State of War with the United States Since 1893 or 1898." And then there's a small debate between those who are looking at routes to deoccupation. We talked. Somebody said the the term uh, "agents of occupation" or "operatives of occupation." Um, Sai is kind of like an operative of deoccupation. That's exactly what he is. He portrays himself as an academic, but really his thing is deoccupation. And his view is that uh, a military government, that this is all sort of military law, which he distinguishes from martial law, so a small distinction. He's saying that it's the United States military's responsibility to facilitate the end of occupation, because occupation is supposed to be, by definition, temporary. And then there's another scholar who um, was part of our sort of group, did a dissertation on looking at the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and comparing them to Hawaii. Not the usual comparison of Estonia and Hawaii. And he says in those cases, what they did was simply to reconstitute their legislatures, and that allowed for the, uh, the legal order to sort of come back to life. So there's these two, uh, put it this way, <laughs> I'm the only one who really talks to both of these guys um, anymore. Uh, it's been a very, very sharp division over what I think is a quite technical point. But one point I made in my uh, Nation article was that uh, that this is kind of a new view of Hawaiian history that's percolated out of just the University of Hawaii social sciences into the larger community. Uh, and this last summer there were hearings by the Department of Interior, uh, of Interior to establish a, a nation along the lines of a Native American nation. And at the hearings, there was something like 98% uh, opposed, and almost most of them are using the analysis of occupation. If this is an occupation, then federal recognition of Hawaiians as an indigenous nation is it's not only the wrong way to go, it's, it's actually to constitute the first acknowledgement of America, uh, Hawaiians being American subjects. So that's a pretty typical um, view of a Hawaiian feeling about that. So uh, pretty tumultuous. And then even more recently, Mauna Kea is the, like, the highest mountain in Hawaii. It's actually the tallest mountain in the world measured from the seabed. Um, and they're putting a very large telescope, 30 meter telescope on it. And this is, this is uh, just exploded. It's been in the news all around the world. Um, it's been one of those Twitter, Instagram kind of revolutions. Uh, you see the sign there, bulldoze your own temple. So some protesters in this uh, have been arrested and lawyers in their defense have been offering to use an occupation kind of defense that the judges have no jurisdiction. So this is getting out into the street, into the real world. Um, I didn't know where else to put this slide, but most people should at least know that there was a, there was an apology for the overthrow uh, in 1993, 100th anniversary. But it's interesting that um, they don't apologize for annexation. So. It's a strange situation. They say, okay, the overthrow is illegal, and it seems like it should just follow that annexation is illegal, but, uh, but they never quite got there. So this, there's this kind of double thing among the majority, actually, that there's an illegal overthrow and then a legal uh, annexation that follows it, which I can't really understand. And then, and, I, and I'm getting to the end here, uh, there's even a domestic argument. The, Longest serving professor in the University of Hawaii Law School, Wellington Chang, has been studying this for many, many years and says that the Congress, when they were creating the state of Hawaii, they stumbled on this, uh, the problems with annexation. And so they refused or neglected to define what constituted the state of Hawaii. Um, you know, usually you define a territory, you longitude and latitude, or in Hawaii, it's pretty easy, just name the eight islands, and there's your territory. 
but they don't do that. And so his argument is that they created an empty vessel, that the state of Hawaii is a corporate entity with nothing in it. And so that's, that's a domestic argument completely, but it's the result of this international issue per, uh, trickling down. So in conclusion, in 1843, after the restoration of the kingdom, uh, Kamehameha III said famously, which has been translated as the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. And then it was seemingly uh, unthinkingly adopted as the motto of the state of Hawaii. But the real meaning is the sovereignty of the land is perpetuated. It was celebrating the restoration of sovereignty. So the motto of the state of Hawaii now is a sovereignty slogan for the Hawaiian kingdom that basically says the kingdom still exists. In other words, the motto of the state of Hawaii denies the existence of the state of Hawaii. So that's a good symbol of the kind of uh, society that we're living in. And I use the word society because I, I don't really like the word state, um, state of Hawaii. We're not clear it actually exists. Um, and I don't like the word kingdom either, because we're not clear that that exists either, for sure. We're still in kind of verification. But um, I think it's a good symbol. That picture is the state capital. So it's right there. It's not buried in, in archives. It's right there in plain view. Every state truck has that symbol on it. So everywhere you look, these contradictions are, are right there in your face. And it's a good symbol of uh, what we're living with on a daily basis. Thank you very much. This is my understanding. The difference between martial law and military law is that uh, military law, you simply appoint a, a general, I guess, as governor. Everything else stays the same. All the people stay in place. It's just sort of an official change. Whereas martial law is like uh, curfews and it's, it's much more on the ground. Um, so I don't actually take a position on the two. There's a, there's a good argument on, on both sides, and especially on the other side of the law. What has actually happened in the Baltic state? That's a good precedent for us to be looking at. Who would be a military? Who would be compatible with the military? So it's kind of like the, they become like the coalition provisional authority in Iraq that facilitates a, you know, a new uh, constitution, facilitates uh, getting Hawaii to the point where it has the capacity to as a government. So the argument here is that we have sovereignty, we don't have government. I mean, that's, that's why there's no good dispute on behalf of that sovereignty. And the sovereignty is just a corporate entity. It's just really an idea that you exist. Yeah, I see. Um, the That brings up a lot of a lot of points. Um, 
I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> um, the, the point of legitimate authority we'll talk about. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would say that's what um, this part of the movement has been saying, that uh, we're, not, uh, we're not asking. There's a lot of Hawaiians using um, that. Uh, it's a pretty common thing now. My cousin is a uh, is a, a judge, a per diem judge. So he sometimes um, he goes back and forth, lawyer and judge. But he gets all the time Hawaiians saying you have no jurisdiction. Um, and he lets them go two out of three times. But um, he doesn't know the history. And that goes to education. Um, the state of uh, the teaching of Hawaiian history in Hawaii is kind of catastrophe. Um, that's why I've written a Hawaiian history textbook. It's kind of um, it's, uh, in the editing phases. Um, just because I needed it in my class, but everybody's asking me, you know, when is it going to be finished? Well, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the foundation. Mm. Are you asking me personally or Hawaiians? Me personally. Me personally? Oh, Hawaii, whichever is more comfortable for you to handle. Yeah. Uh, oh. My approach, my view is um, what's our situation and what's the next logical step? And if the occupation seems logical to me, uh, it's, not a, it's not a popular position among. Uh, people in with authority. Um, my uncle is a trustee of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, which is the closest thing that Hawaii has to a government uh, Hawaiians have. Um, but it's a quasi-state institution, <laughs> and I have to kind of go against him all the time because he's entrenched in the in the state system. And there are a lot of people like that. Um, to me, I just sort of look at the facts, and uh, I, I can I can make it in either system. So. And all the other thing is, I grew up in Tonga, so it was a it's a constitutional monarchy. So uh, the idea of a kingdom today is not some uh, fantasy to me. It's something that actually I uh, was six years in a kingdom. Um, it was very poor, but it didn't have a lot of social problems that Hawaii does. So most Hawaiians don't have that experience. They're kind of imagining a kingdom, um, and that's something that uh, I think it's a good. Uh, thought experiment in a sense because you don't necessarily need this huge economy to, in order to take care of basic human rights. Tonga's uh, GDP is something like $200 million. Whereas Hawaii's state GDP is $76 billion. So the economy could shrink and it still could be okay economically, I think. That's only a partial answer, but Actually, no, every single piece, now you can argue the legitimacy of the treaty, but everything is a treaty other than Hawaii. Yeah. Um, and, and we've kind of done the mapping of that. And of course, there's the, there's the underlying issue of um, are those treaties legitimate, but... Uh, no treaty in Alaska. Oh, okay. Texas, okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, 
I'm still at the point of looking into Texas. Uh, maybe people can correct me on this. My, my take on Texas is it's claimed to be annexed by joint resolution, but that's sort of like saying the United States became independent on the 4th of July, 1776. I mean, Americans like to think that, but they fought a war for eight years. To me, they're sovereign at the end of the war, not at the beginning. Otherwise, why fight? Um, and at the end of the war is a treaty of surrender, which recognized, and it's a treaty of recognition, recognition recognizing the 13 colonies as independent states. So... This rule of a treaty is something that's pretty, uh, there, there are very few exceptions to it. Um, even Putin's, I think, fake annexation of Crimea, there was a treaty there. Because even though, I don't think it's really real, but he knows that everybody uh, wants to see a treaty. Whereas in, our, in Hawaii's case, there's, there's not even a treaty to look at, not even a fake treaty. So in the Texas case, there was the, uh, the Mexican-American War after the joint resolution, and then there's a treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which draws the border, and so it's a treaty again. Although I, I, I acknowledge most people would say it was annexed by joint resolution. I, I kind of disagree, but I, I do have to look into it more. I think what's happened is they've split. I mean, my, this is my take on it, is that the word colonization and decolonization have taken on a cultural aspect. And there certainly was cultural colonization, which um, maybe international lawyers would say that the, the, that's not the correct term. It's indoctrination, but I still think, you know, where you come into decolonization of the mind, um, Mugi Waki Yongo, those, those ideas are, are valid in Hawaii. Um, but that's in a separate realm from the legal realm. And so you can have deoccupation and, and then decolonization of the mind. And so they're kind of at two different levels. But um, as far as the legal approach, they seem to be mutually exclusive. You raised the thirty year telescope and the protest about that, yeah. which is dramatic. That's thirteen to fourteen telescope proposed to the top of the mountain. Is, are the protests more intense for this telescope than the previous ones? And, and what's driving that? Because the concern is always there about the protest. Good question. Um, yeah, this is not the first protest. The other ones they were intense, but there wasn't the media um, aspect to it. Um, it's it's social media that's really made this explode, and you have maybe a lot of bandwagon jumpers. Um, uh, I have friends who've been working on the, the telescopes for decades, and working against them, and have just been ignored. But now it's just sort of taken off. Um, I think there's no protest against the first new telescopes, and then it was the, in the 70s, it corresponded with the Hawaiian movement that was arising at the time, Hawaiian Renaissance, so that's when the protest started, and then now it's just at another level. Um, the protesters have been trying to be pretty clear that they're not anti-science, um, and I'm trying to do some work to try to figure out, is it actually a dichotomy, science versus culture, or are they just talking past each other? kind of be looked at in a layered way. Um, it actually gets a little esoteric at that point, but um, that, that's the direction of how I've been thinking about it. So I heard people on the islands on the big island saying that 
they thought that the problem was that the people putting in the new ones were just being politically clumsy and had not brought in the Hawaiian to the conversation. Is that really what's going on there? Or is it people? Yeah, I think they, yeah, some people are saying they followed the process that was in place, but, uh, but there are just people who will never be satisfied by, um, they think it's uh, just tokenism. I'm actually on the fence about the telescope issue somewhat, but uh, I'm trying to look at it in a, in a nuanced way. I think there was one in the back clip. Yeah. Yeah. Unlike a lot of Hawaiians, I'm not saying it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that's where the, this idea of uh, reconstituting a legislature is it's actually a fairly good one because the, the Hawaiian constitution of the kingdom the, had a, a mechanism for elections. So the idea is that could be reactivated and then you'd have a pool of candidates. And I mean... There were two elected monarchs in Hawaii um, who were not uh, descendants of the main Kamehameha line. And then compare that to the election we're looking at here with um, Clinton versus Bush and ask yourself which one is a hereditary monarchy. <laughs> I mean, it's quite striking. So, yeah, I'm not sure how viable it is, but that's the, that's the basic argument. There are people who are descendants of uh, heirs to the throne. But um, there's issues. The Republicans, for one. Um, no, that's a huge point of contention. <laughs> we invented surfing. <laughs> getting to be a collegiate sport. <laughs> there are sovereignty groups who have passports that they've tried to use. Um, we talked a little bit about trying to get into the South Pacific games. At least maybe the South Pacific Islands would accept us and accept this argument and um, sharpen our track spikes and try it that way through sport and then Olympics next. But uh, there's a lot of work to be done, not enough people to do it. But that's one of the big issues. Well, now it's uh, 500,000. There's a lot of Hawaiians now, um, but almost half of them are on the continent. seem to be far more than ceremonial or emblematic. Uh, why is it on your list? Why shouldn't it be uh, a really strong indicator of uh, affirmation of independent status and non-occupied status? The treaty? The treaty is that you enumerated. Um, well, the United States declared all treaties null and void uh, at the time of annexation. 
Um, and then countries seem to follow suit, and then Switzerland seems to be the one breaking ranks just now. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a puzzle. It's, it's really unclear how much was known at the time about what was going on in Hawaii. Um, apparently the Swiss authorities thought there had been a treaty. So that might have been the case with others as well. Uh, and so the United States becomes like a successor state and, and the, the other party to the treaty no longer exists and people may have thought that. Uh, there, there was a protest against annexation by Japan, actually. And there were signs that there might have been protests uh, by Britain, um, both treaty partners. But uh, they never got to the point of um, really challenging the, the alleged annexation. That's kind of where we are with that question. Just start by saying, I misspoke before, there was a treaty in Alaska, but it was in Russia. Okay. Not with the native people, yeah. so you're right. Um, but you said, I mean, in, in sort of, I guess I would add another problem and limitation, um, and that is, I mean, early on the talk to Mike doesn't make life, and sort of the, the reason argument for seeing convinced me, right? Um, but thinking in, in terms of the, the politics, you know, I'm afraid I think Mike often does make right in the eyes of right, the U.S. government. So you've got, I mean, just looking at what's happened right in this region, right, you've got Seneca and Cayuga last places, which were dismissed due to invoking the doctrine of last. So it's not saying that your arguments are wrong, or what you did is illegal. It's saying too much time has passed, and we're not going right, to undo the wrongs that we committed create, create more wrongs than the defense. Right? So that it doesn't matter what your reason or arguments are, you don't get it. And that's an I mean, if there was ever an implication of might make it right, that's the other So how I guess how would you I know there's no great solution to that, but I mean that's another thing that's sort of the elephant in the in the room. Yeah, that's good. Um, can I take a question and come back to you? I have to kind of... Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, so I was going to add a point that there's So the theory that things they lasted so long and become legal. Um, and the, well, first of all, the theory of conflict. So if the United States signs a decolonization and a decolonization declaration, it doesn't, it says that conflict doesn't last. Um, in Canada, there is a, there is a, well, uh, have you ever read Gordon Bennett, the international lawyer, Gordon Bennett? No, I haven't. Well, he talks here about a whole discussion on what happened with the United Nations Declaration on Decolonization and how come it didn't apply to the United States. And he makes an interesting case about Canada where he says, well, the Inuit, so there's this blue water community. It's too complicated to get the whole thing right now. But the thesis basically was that it's only a free state when the colonizing country is culturally different and geographically separate from the colony. And there's a way of rescuing all these states from the kind of colony. Mm -hmm. Right? So, and in my mind, that's how come you end up with the indigenous, the Declaration of Indigenous Freedom. But they never get that kind of past the United Nations, so it might have been worth something else. But he said that there were two, there was one exception. But the Inuit of Canada is so far away from anyone else in Canada that they probably passed the test of the 
I can't imagine any state that doesn't pass the test of a blue water resolution than Hawaii. So I'm not sure that we're not external to because it's the same argument that Belgium tried to use to annex the Belgian Congo. If, if annex the Belgian Congo, it said this is a one of our provinces of Belgium, so therefore we're not a colonial power anymore. And the world community said no. That's why they passed this implementation resolution that captured Belgium. Because it said prima facie not a colony. It's prima facie a colony when it's geographically separate. Hawaii is geographically separate. I don't know why that isn't an argument. Strong but it, as far as I know, just in terms of English law, because I don't know American law, but in terms of English law, prescription, which is the thesis that we're talking about here, requires that the power that, so, so that submitted to the occupation is silent about protest against it constitutes arguments against the legitimacy of it. So I think the only thing the United States could ever do, and this is where Paul is absolutely right, but it's totally problematic, <laughs> is, is that they have de facto sovereignty. That's all they can prove is that they have de facto sovereignty. But you're arguing the jury sovereignty. Yes. You're not arguing that they don't have de facto sovereignty. Yeah. Right now. You're arguing you have no justification in the jury for it. And I think that you can strengthen the arguments the way that I suggested. It's just a suggestion. Yeah, that actually makes me think of a response to Paul's provocative question. Um, even though at the time of the overthrow, there was a U.S. minister, basically ambassador to Hawaii, who did you know what ambassadors are not supposed to do, coach them along about how to perpetrate the overthrow. He actually said, these are the buildings you need to take over if you want to control you know, Honolulu. Um, even he, who was helping plan the overthrow, uh, when he recognized the provisional government, said this is the de facto government. He did not say it's a de jure government. And this is someone who's most likely to say, uh, to try to legitimize it. Um, in international law, sort of the case law of international law, there are two conditions for extinguishing sovereignty through an occupation. One is a, there's a precedent set that is a 205 years pass. Uh, you have to meet that or no effective resistance and the petitions are uh, evidence that, so neither of those two are, are met. Um, so 117 years have passed since annexation and to me, I, I've been arguing that that's not really that long ago. That the, the last oldest person in the world, a uh, woman from Japan, who just died about a month ago, uh, was born in January 1898, so before annexation. So to me, it's like one really, really long lifetime ago. It's not. Uh, my, my grandmother was born, uh, well, was seven when Queen Didi Okalani died, and my grandmother died in 2002. So to me, it's really not that long ago. So, um, and then one more thing is the, uh, the people have been following the situation with Iran and the treaty, um, and then that uh, the senators who wrote the letter to the, to calling the 43 traitors. And the response from Iran, back to those senators, to me was, it's sort of like the things we've been trying to say for a decade. Um, the world is not the United States, it said, right? And the relations between nations are the subject of international law, not domestic law. And I, I'm starting to use that as a counter-argument to people who, who cite Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, as a, a support for the legality of annexation, which is like two boxers and, you know, let's call them Manny and uh, Floyd, <laughs> and they fight and there's no knockout, and you say, okay, Floyd, you can make up the rules about who wins. And he says, whoever hugs the other guy the most gets to win. <laughs> Sorry to use such a lowbrow um, example, but uh, that's like the Supreme Court, and that's why the Alito example is, is problematic on many levels. Thank you. 
Just to relate to Hawaii, you know, the, Hawaii, the reason Hawaii has its own law school is that um, the, the law in Hawaii, the common law of the state of Hawaii is the, the kingdom law. So these laws were very um, civil code, it was very fleshed out, um, and yet they don't really teach it anywhere. There's nowhere you can really learn Hawaiian kingdom law, so they're sort of basing their um, judgments and um, faulty basis, even though they recognize that that's always the common law. So it's another one of those problems. Yeah, there's a practical aspect to this, there's, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, yeah, the, the law of nations, the Westphalian system is, is inherently kind of racist, and um, it's Christian countries only in the beginning. Uh, in fact, Hawaii was the first, the first country with a non-European head of state to be in that system. So um, that means there's all these others who are kind of marginalized by the system. Um, actually, I was going to say in my talk, and just just um, talking to Paul earlier, it made me think of, um, we had a professor at UH named Jody Bird, and she moved to um, Illinois, and she had a lot of uh, tense interactions with Johnny Sai, and I was in the class, and she said something that really made me think, which was, um, he doesn't see us the way we see ourselves. Uh, and I and I'm definitely and, uh, I can definitely sympathize with that for sure. That um, uh, there's been a there's been a, a separation among the between the advocates of indigenous and the sort of state sovereignty people in Hawaii. That's a split in our in our little movement. It's, it's probably not super productive, at least in the long term. And so I try to um, not not be completely in one camp. It's just that uh, my work has taken me more into the, the direction that I have. Because there's other people out there making argument that Hawaii deserve Hawaiians deserve federal recognition. You know, it's, it's been so long in the time of coming. And, I don't really believe that, but I don't um, completely dismiss it either. Yeah, I'm aware of the um, how different analyses take you down these paths and then you start to believe in those paths um, as if that's the important thing and the important thing is sort of the, it is the moral issue um, and then just to keep it in perspective an example is uh, in 19 um, 
1946, Hawaii was placed on a list of non-self-governing territories. It was a territory of Hawaii, but it, it, it didn't elect their own governor. It had a, a, a delegate who went to Congress and couldn't vote in Congress. It was non-self-governing. Um, and so there's been a part of the movement, a pretty major part of the sovereignty movement that's been trying to get Hawaii put back on that list. But this analysis is saying Hawaii never should have been on that list in the first place. It was, it was self-governing and then occupied. That's not a list of occupied. So that's another example. Of well, that list um, made you eligible for decolonization. So there's a fines for decolonization, and that, that, was, that was brought up. Uh, this analysis is saying it's just a wrong path. Any questions? I would just, I would just reiterate that I, I, I take a fairly academic viewpoint of this and, and try to look at the, the range of options. Um, your question made me kind of think about the, when you said the practical implications, it's the, the, really the economics of it, which is, um, you know, in Hawaii there was a group called the Big Five. It was five corporations that ran everything. Uh, they really, really did monopolies vertically and horizontally. Uh, but uh, there's almost like a new Big Five, which is comprised of Hawaiian trusts. Uh, the school that I work for has an endowment of $11 billion. It was larger than Harvard 15 years ago. Um, our school owns 9% uh, of all the land in Hawaii. And there's four other trusts like that. There's a Hawaiian Homestead Trust that has 200,000 acres. Uh, if you go and look for a job in Hawaii, it's the Hawaiian institutions that are actually hiring. But people aren't quite seeing that yet. That um, It's like the new big five, and, those, and most of those are trusts established by uh, chiefs or monarchs who had a lot of land, and they used that land because almost all the chiefs had no children. They created these trusts, and uh, they covered all the vulnerable sectors of Hawaiian society. And now they're, they're quite powerful, and um, there's, there's an effort to make them sort of act with one purpose. That's a, that's a hard thing to do, but um, then you start to have the real economic basis. I mean, my, my school alone is larger than a lot of, economically larger than a lot of developing countries. You know? um, so the, the, the practical ability to do things is there, it just hasn't really been coordinated. participating in the institute you come up here you need to clear signals for transportation. Hi, that's a person. That's nice to meet you. I enjoyed your talk. I Thank you. teach a uh, grad student course on the big island oh. uh, in collaboration with UHE. Okay. But I was just over uh, chatting with Earl Kim. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my boss. He's, a, he's a Cornell grad. That's right. Did you know that? Yeah. He approved my 
Oh, so did he? Oh, good for him. <laughs> yeah, I had a very pleasant talk with that as well. He actually understands his occupation for him. He's a Marine's background and officer. I'm not sure if he understands it. Most people really don't know. It's very um, it's careful yeah. Yeah. what he says, but he needs to be. But yeah. Yeah. We were talking about that. We were talking about, um, well, getting support for our, our interaction with UH Hilo, but also because the environments that we study it would be nice to have access to many of schools' lands. And if you want to very happy to help us do that. So that's what we're supposed to do. They have a lot of land that they, they, they can't even really take care of, so they let people um, become the stewards of it. Yeah. I mean, we just want to. I, I studied these cultural rock tools, and there's some oh, on I mean, in, in on the uh, ankle and ponds along the. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so they own some land and ponds in Puna. Yeah, down in Puna, but those aren't the kinds that we want. So, but anyway, they're really beautiful, but. They're on Kamehameha land, so we look in them, but we don't take anything because it's not our we don't have permission. He said the contract was But anyway, I, I've become very interested in this, this problem of science because we saw some with the telescope that we were just there two weeks ago. The protests and very, very different points of view depending on who I was talking to. So, yeah. it's, 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 it's a tough night. The telescope is particularly it becomes a kind of symbol, though. Yeah, and a mountain is a symbol. Yeah. 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 yeah, and you look at the mountain and it's like works on the mountain. So it's, it's, it's there for everybody to see all the time. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much. Enjoy. Very nice to meet you. So many Hawaii connections here. Yeah, there are. Yeah, we're going to go to Hawaii. Two of our participants. Hawaii. There was a Hawaii club. I had a student from Hawaii working in my lab. This was ten years ago. She invited us to go out and that the students put on. So there seems to be a maybe it's. I mean, there were a lot of Hawaii students are from Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. But they were, you know, how many of them are from Hawaii? I used to play the music for the art of my father in California. Yeah. Yeah. It's a community building. Community and outside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you here just for a few days? Or? Yeah, just to start anyway. Have you been here before? No, I've been to the Catskills. Yeah. My wife is from the Berkshire one. Lennox Mass. We go there about two years. It's so different. Yeah. Well, I hope you get to see some of the environment that's really pretty here. I guess we're going after this. Oh, yeah? The park. Yeah? The waterfall. There's a lot of waterfalls. <laughs> but good, you'll get to see a waterfall. <laughs> All right. Nice okay. to meet you. Yeah. Thanks. So on Treaty Party Play and I've read more of a thousand desserts. Um, you gotta read that. It's, it's, on, um, it's on basically that's Brian and it's about the basically a few decades before and after the Mexican War, and it's focusing on the, the Comanche Army and Indian raids in the context because he starts with the eleventh article of the Treaty of Um says that both countries are responsible for protecting civilians from Indian raids, and that's like the opening of yet. but it's so much about um, the question of annexation, like he looks a lot of the process of how the U.S. actually carried out annexation and then in relation to the parallel story of the Comanche and the Apache. Oh, I have that mic because I got my dad Comanche Empire. And he's like, oh, you got to read this other one, too. So I have that one sitting in my desk. Yeah. But you should, you'd like this one. Uh, it, it's, it was, I, I, I had been wondering about this one a week ago. Um, 
I'll give it to you tomorrow. Yeah, right. yeah. Are you going to be here tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be here Wednesday. Okay, I'll be sure. Come with us. Oh, yeah. Just. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it means there's only 49 states.